Good morning and welcome to the 28th meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're turned to silence. The first item on our agenda is the final evidence session on the committee's arts funding inquiry. And I would like to welcome our panel of witnesses, uh, Fiona Hislop, our Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs, David Sears, Head of Sponsorship and Funding in the Culture and Historic Environment Division of the Scottish Government, and Anne Munfries, the Senior Arts Advisor at the Culture and Historic Environment Division. Thank you all for coming today. The committee's inquiry has covered a lot of ground and for this reason we have quite a lot of material to cover uh, with the Cabinet Secretary, a, a lot of uh, questions. So I'd therefore like to ask members and, uh, and the Cabinet Secretary uh, to keep answers as succinct as possible, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement. Yes, thank you, Convener, briefly. And thank you uh, for your invitation to contribute into this committee's inquiry into arts funding and uh, for the opportunity to make some very brief opening remarks. Um, I, I believe that in Scotland and within the Scottish Government, the value and importance of arts funding is in no doubt. Uh, we believe strongly that it is important to fund art for art's sake. Uh, we also recognise that culture funds benefit our nation and society much more widely and impact on many other policy areas. And they contribute uh, to delivering government's uh, purpose and values and are fundamental to our national performance framework and outcomes. And as you're aware, this impact is recognised in the introduction of the new cultural outcome. I quote, we are creative and our vibrant and diverse cultures are expressed and enjoyed widely. So it's very helpful that the committee is taking a longer term view of the whole subject of arts funding through this inquiry. Uh, committee members are aware of the current budget challenges and this inquiry is therefore all the more welcome and giving us a chance to look further to the future collectively, investigating different funding models and considering new ideas and aspirations to inform longer term decision making. And at this time, uh, it will also uh, give us the opportunity to allow for synergy with the recent work undertaken on the culture strategy which will be published after the general election uh, and the reviews initiated uh, by Creative Scotland in this area. This inquiry I hope uh, and expect will help us inform dis future discussions and policy. So I'd like to take this opportunity simply to restate some general principles of arts funding. Uh, we're committed to supporting artists and protecting the cultural assets which we have and working creatively towards uh, growth even in times of financial hardship. We must also bear in mind the importance of maintaining the arm's length principle between government and detailed decision funding decisions, while nevertheless maintaining high expectations of those making funding decisions as included in our letters of grant and guidance to them. And as the committee will have heard me say before, we must also continue to look beyond specific culture funding budgets to leverage funding from other areas of public investment, recognising that this is both necessary and justified by the impacts of culture on so many other other areas of public benefit. And it's because of those benefits that as Culture Secretary during these recent years of financial challenge, I've sought to protect budgets as far as possible, ensuring that the sector has always been able to progress confidently and recently uh, backfilling Creative Scotland's lottery deficit to the tune of £6.6 .6 million a year, not an inc inconsiderable funding achievement in a time of pressured public funding. And this support is vital to our artists and arts organisations' capacity to thrive. And just a few words about the international models included in the Commission research and in the evidence given to date. The draft culture strategy also drew inspiration from good practice internationally, but it is always wise to remember that it can be easy to see the potential benefits of others' processes, but less simple to identify sustainable impacts and establish sound evidence that solutions that work in other countries will work equally here in Scotland. Um, and of course, finally, uh, Scotland makes a significant global contribution when it comes to culture. Uh, that was further evidence, for example, by the recent news that Glasgow has been listed as the top cultural and creative centre in the UK in a study from the European Commission coming first for openness, tolerance and trust and cultural participation and attractiveness out of a study of 190 cities in 30 European countries. So I hope convener on that positive note and uh, with my remarks uh, we can have a fruitful discussion as you come to the end of your arts funding inquiry. Thank you very much Cabinet Secretary, that was very useful. Um, 
You'll be aware that the committee's inquiry uh, into the arts funding has two main strands. Uh, the first considered the support that's provided directly to artists, and the second strand considered how the overall funding framework could be strengthened, both in terms of the, the actual funding itself and, and how it's structured. Uh, I want to start with the support that's available to individual artists, because that's really quite a, a, a major uh, theme of, of the inquiry. Um, we've taken quite a lot of evidence from artists uh, themselves who, um, if you going back to the row over the regular funding, it was a th theme that came out then that um, organisations uh, received public funding, but there wasn't any necessarily any guarantee that substantial parts of that funding would be passed on to artists themselves, <laughs> and we had quite a lot of discussions about artists uh, around that. I know that in um, Creative Scotland's uh, own uh, guidance, they, they do actually, uh, on rates of pay, they say that uh, paying artists, uh, artists should be funded fairly, but they also say it's not Creative Scotland's role to prescribe the rates of pay that any organisation applies when employing staff or when working with and commissioning artists and creative practitioners. And I just wondered if you, you had a view on that, because obviously in this sector, you know, there's lack of sick pay, lack of holiday pay. Often people, you know, work well over the hours that they're originally contracted to do. Their expenses aren't always met. And I just wondered if you had a view on that. Well, on the broader issue of fair work, um, the committee were aware that it is something that the, the Scottish Government is very keen, is embraced right across all different sectors and obviously support for the living wage itself. Um, Creative Scotland's guidance sets out their assessment process and what they'll be looking for in an application. And, and, and if I can quote, actually states, uh, Creative Scotland is committed through any activities we support to ensure that artists and those professionals are paid fairly and appropriately. And then uh, it goes on to say, when working with artists and creative professionals, we would encourage applicants to reference relevant industry standards on rates of remuneration, such as those outlined by the Musicians Union, the Scottish Artists Union, Equity Back to, or the Writers Guild, for more information through the guidance on industry standards. Um, we would expect all RFOs to commit to play a living wage according to the Living Wage Foundation. So I think you know, what's set out to the you know, regularly funding uh, organisations uh, is quite clear. Um, what they've obviously given to you in evidence, and they may say about how they interpret that, um, may be a bit looser than what they actually say in their documentation. Uh, but we're clear that we would expect rates of pay to be adhered to. I think your point about, and I think this goes into some of the other areas around, how do you regularise income? Um, there are uh, evidence and you see that from other countries. I spoke to the Icelandic culture minister just um, this week. Uh, they pay uh, an income. They can. They have uh, uh, an artist's income that people can apply for. It's at a particularly high level. It's actually a lecturer's uh, salary at university. I'm sure many artists would love to have that kind of position, but Iceland may be in a particular situation that they can do that, and it may be very limited. Uh, but I think the point about social security and pensions and those other areas, I think, is a real issue. About it's not just about the kind of income they're getting in the here and now. And in terms of what they're getting paid, but it's actually how do you give stability over a longer term. A lot of that, as you'll know, will involve working with pensions, social security and powers that we currently don't have in this parliament. Um, but I think that's the bit that I think if we can try and work um, on that, it would be very, very helpful. So I do think in terms of uh, those in receipt of funding uh, from the Scottish Government via Creative Scotland or whoever else, we would expect them to pay the living wage and indeed to set out in their uh, own documentation. Um, and I think that's something that I would expect them to have close scrutiny of. And if that was a recommendation in your report, I think that would be very welcome. Yeah, I, I think most people agree that the living wage is the bare minimum. Uh, and many of the people that are involved in, you know, like the organisations that receive grant funding are paid well above uh, the living wage. Um, you, you mentioned Iceland. Uh, we took evidence from Orla McBride, the director of the uh, Arts Council in Ireland, and they have uh, different grants for individual artists that cover not just projects, which is what our, f our funding uh, structure through Creative Scotland tends to cover projects, but they do pay artists for their time and they pay uh, certain bursaries and stipends at different levels, recognising artists' achievements and uh, the, wherever they are in their career, um, which is uh, not necessarily the living wage, but would be above that. Do you think we need to maybe be looking at going down that sort of road? Uh, I, I think it's an interesting 
idea. I think you, as I said in my opening remarks, I think you've got to look in the context of those countries. So what Ireland also does is provide uh, tax-free um, uh, uh, allowances up to, I understand, uh, 50,000 for any work that is produced. So there's an issue about what you pay for, you know, and how you make sure that they, they can have an income from selling their work, if it's a visual artist or other kind of income for, for their areas. Uh, but there is an interesting point about um, supporting artists at different points in their career. And that can be different for different industries. I think there has probably been a great focus um, up until now on emerging artists and supporting new artists. Uh, but uh, there is a kind of issue about what happens in, on that journey um, and how can you make sure that, again, it's a sustainability issue, which I think runs right through a lot of the evidence that you've had. So I do think there's something very interesting about trying to do that at different stages, but that would take a, a shift. And it also means in limited budgets, you'll be taking away from something else to pay it to, to for this area. And I think there would need to be a, a good understanding publicly um, of what that means. I think in the current climate, with some of the uh, the media that we have just now, there are certain newspapers would have a field day in attacking that. So therefore, if that was something that we wanted to do as a country, we would need cross-party, a real endorsement of that as an approach. Okay. One of the suggestions that was made in some of the evidence that we, we took was from some of the older artists mentioned that the Enterprise Allowance Scheme in the past, um, uh, which uh, was going back to the 1980s, uh, which you and I may remember, um, actually turned out to be quite a useful thing for artists. Um, and a number of local authorities currently are... are having feasibility studies uh, into a basic citizen's income. Um, so the people who had suggested that the Enterprise Loan Scheme had been useful for artists in the past suggested that perhaps uh, basic citizen's income could play, play that role in future. I mean, would you be um, open to including artists within the feasibility studies on basic citizen's income? I'm, I'm not obviously the minister directly uh, responsible for, for those pilots or indeed working with the local authorities that are carrying out those pilots, but we have had and I've had discussions with those that are piloting it that that would be a very good uh, area to go down. I think in terms of the limitations of you know, saying that we don't necessarily have social security or some of the other kind of other areas that we could work with in this area, um, I think artist residencies, uh, citizens income uh, are all things that I think are, would be quite helpful in this area and is something that we potentially could do. So I am interested in that area. Uh, I do think there is something, though, that people might ex have expectations in artists of what they do. That's why I think t some of the idea of, uh, as some I understand some local authorities are looking at it, is tying citizens' income issues uh, in relation to some kind of residency work in communities. And again, the aspect of place is a huge part of what we'll be carrying through with the, the culture strategy and a you know, big consciousness of that in Scotland about the importance of relating artists to place. So that that's a possibility as well. So I think I'm very open to that. Okay, that's, I'm sure many people will welcome that. Just, just to go back to my original point about the way funding is given, as you're aware, one of the criticisms of the RFO process and uh, indeed all the grant awarding processes in Creative Scotland is that individual artists are competing against organisations uh, for, for different funding pots. Now, those organisations that, that get the funding, they might be umbrella organisations, sectoral organisations, and, uh, and they're all employing people. Uh, mo most of their salaries probably aren't going on artists. They'll go on off uh, officers or managers, um, PR, marketing, that kind of thing. Um, and it had been suggested to us in, in some of the um, evidence that we took that you, really there ought to be some kind of audit. Um, if a, if a, an organisation gets money through Creative Scotland, then they should be able to prove how much that money passes on to artists and there should actually be, um, it shouldn't fall below a certain level. Uh, what do you think of that? It's going back to your newspaper point of view, about your point, you know, like newspapers might make a fuss about artists getting uh, sums of money, but actually we do actually pay out quite large sums of money um, to these organisations and these people are employed by public money, but they're on good salaries, though they're not artists. So I, I don't think it's an either or. I think everybody acknowledge that there is a role for, for example, the Federation of Scottish Theatres or different umbrella organisations that work with the sector. I suppose the issue is when people think that, the, and, and in some cases, in certain, if you're simplifying funding routes, then you are going to be ending up uh, competing potentially against 
uh, large organisations. It's actually one of the, as, I far, as far as I remer remember, and that was even before my time as Culture Secretary, um, some of the issues around the national performing companies who used to be funded by the Arts Council being removed and taken uh, into direct funding relationship with the, with the government because you had these big organisations, big national companies in the same funding uh, pots as uh, individual artists or others trying to seek um, funding as well. So that's one of the arguments that I, I noticed in some of the evidence, somebody suggesting we need to bring that back together, that these be a pipeline that has the national performing in the same kind of route. Well, actually, there are dangers there, precisely for what you're saying, is that if you end up um, larger organisations necessarily in the same funding streams, potentially as smaller, where does that leave you? I think what's been, um, if you look at some of the kind of recent history, uh, and it comes back again to the arguments of, is it a good thing to ring fence or is it not? Um, in recent past, in a number of uh, recent years, uh, some of the funding from the Scottish Government uh, was ring fence for umbrella organisations and at the request of uh, Creative Scotland to allow them a bit more flexibility, again in pressure times, sometimes having flexibility, not having ring fencing allows you to, to move things. Um, the, the, uh, they moved the umbrella organisations from being you know, the funding that came from the Scottish Government ring fenced and moved it into the regular funding organisations. So, you know, these sometimes you know, you make changes uh, ten years ago um, that you then come back to, or five years ago, but there were reasons and rationale for these at different different points. I, th I think the, the point, and I think some of the evidence somewhere that they have to provide. Some organisations, you know, our companies or uh, our countries have to show something right. You know, that they're spending over their grant over 50% in uh, with artists. I think is a, not not unreasonable that you have to demonstrate that actually this is producing art. I do think though there is a role, particularly for umbrella organisations, at difficult times to help leverage in funding from other sources than either government or organisations. So, I, as I said, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. But how can you make sure that at the end of the day that you're not diminishing the impact and the funding that actually goes to individual um, artists? OK, thank you very much. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, so the committee have taken evidence from local government as part of the inquiry. And the cabinet sector will be well aware that culture is not a statutory service provided by local authorities. And we have heard about the pressure of funding on local authorities. We'll not get into the debate around local authority funding this morning. But can I ask, um, we did hear about the In Place project that was run by Creative Scotland, and we heard positive things um, about that. So can I ask how the Cabinet Secretary is looking to work with local authorities in a way that would support activity that they carry out? I think and that could, includes, if yeah. just, sorry, the, sorry. an interest in the draft culture strategy. What can involvement local authorities or COSLA have had in preparing the draft culture strategy? Uh, well, well cer certainly in terms of the uh, discussions and consultation, Vocal has been heavily involved. I think it's fair to say that COSLA of, in recent years have been less um, than engaged and, and enthusiastic on the culture areas than they've done in previous years. That might be down to individual circumstances. It might be down to offices in COSLA not having the resources or time pressures to, to be able to focus on this um, but it's not been as involved as it could have been and I cite the com complete different um, approach that, uh, that, that was taken with COSLA in relation to the, the uh, Public li Libraries National Strategy which has been extremely successful so even despite as you'll see in the, the stats library funding going down the actual positive inc impact numbers reached and engagement and satisfaction is actually up which shows you that sometimes the resource it's not necessarily about the funding it's actually about what you do and I'm absolutely convinced convinced that working with local authorities and having the uh, public libraries uh, national strategy has really helped there. So um, in terms of the you know, example of place, I mean, place actually came uh, as a result of, in Edinburgh, as a result of the city deal. Uh, it doesn't involve the UK government, so it wasn't necessarily technically part of the, you know, the region city deal. Um, and that's £15 million over five years as proposed in the original outset. So that's a considerable amount in terms of revenue funding, primarily to help Edinburgh and the fest Edinburgh festivals engage with the local community in Edinburgh and other strategic work to help them um, and it was announced at the time of their 70th anniversary so that's a match funding principle that you've seen with Sue Creative Scotland is that yeah, so it's the city deal, but is that the the, it was, that the, the debates Scotland came out the city the, the debates came out the city deal, but you know the city deals have got UK government, yes. Scottish government, local authority government. But the place funding, so did that? That's yeah, the, the place Scotland funding. Project the, pla the place funding um, is uh, one million pounds uh, a year from the Scottish government. 
from Edinburgh City Council and also from the festivals themselves. So that's the three partners. Um, it wasn't part of the city deal because it doesn't involve the UK government. They're not part of that. I and mean, they've helped with the, um, some contribution to the Impact Centre, again, uh, which is being proposed here as a concert hall in Edinburgh. There, so that's a, an example of match funding. Um, it's not without its challenges. Uh, and in terms of certainty, it's over a longer period of time. And as you were, I'm dealing with yearly budgets. I don't even know what budget I'm going to have next year because, as you know, we've got, we've had to obviously wait to the UK government to understand what budgets we have. So that certainty of funding is helpful. Um, I prefer, and I think it's a good example, where you support people who want to do things. There's a danger in that because some local authorities you've just seen have absolutely decimated their culture funding, whereas others, um, I'll give East Ayrshire, Perth and Kinross, um, Sterling have had positive experiences. It's really hard to tell what local authorities are doing because so many of them are now working with trusts and this committee or is in its previous iteration has, has looked at that. And it's different uh, and it's a different um, issue funding and working with trusts than it might be directly with local authorities. Now you have successful trusts like Glasgow Life who are doing extremely well and we do partnership with them. So I think when you say working and matching with local authorities you have to look very carefully because nowadays most of them are not funding things directly and they're doing it through alios. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of questions. The place, sorry to go back to the place programme, but am I correct? The place programme did fund 19 local authorities. The, the Creative Scotland. Oh, sorry. I mean, you're, so you're talking about the place partnership, right? So there's two. Yeah, the so that's where they are. Okay. So the, the, there's a, a there's a initiative called Place, which I've just described, which is just for Edinburgh, and is. Uh, around the Edinburgh festivals and the convener um, attended an event where they were explaining what happened at the festivals this year and in the, in the summer. That's one thing. What I think you're referring to is, is, is the place partnerships where, the local, where uh, Creative Scotland, and this is the one you're referring to, is Creative Scotland, will have worked with different local authorities, usually several in one year, to try and help facilitate, sometimes in consultancy, sometimes in payment. Um, I think some of the challenges with that is some, you know, once the initial period of engagement, um, I've, I remember going to South Asia, for example, um, a lot of good activity there, but then uh, when the engagement then moved on um, to another local authority, uh, is that does that continue and is that sustainable? And I don't think, and I, I may be corrected, that uh, although local authorities might have got interested in partner funding at the time that Creative Scotland was with them working in place partnership, I don't think there's evidence necessary that it's continued to, to the extent that, that it has. And did that funding, that was just part of, that wasn't a particular fund that Creative Scotland were given to do this? That no, just that, of their existing that was their initiative. Budget, and their initiative, their initiative right. and their funding. And can I ask, um, you said that some local authorities are investing in culture and others have decimated their funding. What do you think the issues are for that? Without, I mean, I would argue that local authorities don't get enough funding and that's what's happened. But how, would you see that as being, how can we prevent that happening? And obviously that has an impact on people who live in that area, who will be see, receiving a lower cultural offering than people in other areas. Yeah, I, how I, can we it, well, prevent the, the, the that point is it's so different. Continuing? You know, because if you're, and, and, and I appreciate that we're not going to get into the, uh, necessarily the arguments of local, the level of local government funding gen generally, but even if we're saying it's pressured, and we all know that you know, public funding is pressured for us, for everybody, um, the disparity between some local authorities, uh, and particularly from a year to year, is quite striking. So when some of them, and I'll use my own example, West Lothian, I've gone, I mean, they're, they're, they're the, the, in terms of the worst council in terms of cutting their resources in terms of culture. If you compare that to some of the others, which have, have actually got you know increases of 15% or you know or, or higher, um, there are some local authorities that are really embracing culture as a way forward. And Renfrewshire is a very good example with their new economic strategy. They, they've really put culture at the heart of that. A number of the city deals, which going back to local government, um, look at um, the Tay City deal, this, um, which has got I think 35 million pounds of culture and tourism funding proposed in it, uh, uh, joint funded from the different partners. Uh, Sterling is. <laughs> 15 million. But if you compare that, and I know it's because my own local area and I'm conscious I'm government minister and this is a constituency issue. The leader of the council, when I wrote to him, replied and said, no, we're just going to support those things that have got commercial opportunities. And that means their, you know, their, their theatre that has tribute bands and occasionally other type of art artistic experience. Um, the Borough Halls, which has an, a, a great, they have great uh, paintings. And then they've got the Bathgate Regal Theatre, which is going through refurb. So the, their view was that it wasn't their role to fund 
you know, uh, what you and I might consider community-based cultural activity and organisations. And they're taking organisations um, and some of them youth arts organisations and saying they're completely and utterly going to have to depend on Creative Scotland or other funding. Now, I don't think that's the right way to approach, um, to approach things. I think the approach which you're seeing in other local authorities of, and I can say of different political party persuasions, and I think the ones I've given you are, are, are for a sweetener range, is when they actually see the opportunity. So sometimes it's about seeing the opportunities about the power of culture to help change lives, and also the, you know, the point about tourism, the point about um, in, engagement, and we're increasingly seeing it with older generations, uh, increasing the number of older people, um, the quality of life that can be provided with cultural activity, a whole range of different areas. So I don't think it's necessarily down to amount of funding. I think it's about how different individual local authorities see things. I'm very keen, as you know, to encourage and meet with all the uh, culture conveners um, of all the different local authorities. I need COSLA to engage me with that. I find it in increasingly frustrating and difficult. Um, to do that, and I, I, I will keep pursuing it. But uh, I think that the, if we work together in tandem, we can do great things, even in difficult times. It's not all about the level of funding, it's the political will that goes with it as well. Now, when we heard um, the, the convener mentioned about evidence from um, the Irish government and, and their arts body last week. Um, so in Ireland, they did pass legislation that established a memorandum of understanding at the highest level and a framework agreement with each local authority. Um, now, I know here we all have a commitment to local decision-making, but do you think there is um, a, possibly some advantage and a more formal... I know you've, you've mentioned the, the regular meeting that is meant to take place between local authorities, yourself, and COSLA, and the difficulties in trying to um, have that meeting. Do you think there is any advantage in going down a road where there is a more formal understanding between government and local authorities about what kind of cultural provision there, there has I, to be? I would like that. That's what we did for national libraries. Uh, you know, so the, the public libraries uh, national strategy. I think that's a good way and framework of, of understanding. I think the Irish situation is quite different. They're actually quite centralised compared to, to Scotland. And their underpinning legislation allows direct, ministerial direction of local authorities in relation to culture that we don't have. And I suspect looking around this table, there are a number of Ross was nodding there. Um, uh, if I was to take that into the chamber, I just don't think I'd get the political support in this current climate of people's approach and Scotland's approach to local government, where it seems you know, we need to be in partnership and we can't dictate. So I think the idea of, of and I think what uh, Creative Scotland were trying to do in the place partnerships you were trying to identify is to have almost like memorandum and frameworks with individual local authorities rather than doing it collectively. What Ireland's done is managed to get a national, a national one. Um, but they've also, uh, I think, learned from their uh, decade of com commemorations and they were very, very, uh, I think, pleasantly surprised at the impact of taking a culture-led approach and the activities that took place right through all the different counties across Ireland. And that's given them further. And I've spoken to a number of culture ministers from Ireland at different times. And that led to great um, impetus in them seeing the opportunity to galvanise the cultural activity by you know, um, doing something similar, but to do it with the memorandum and the framework as well. So we'll watch that very closely. I just think in our context politically and our relationship with local government is not such I, that I think at this time, either they or indeed some parties within this parliament would accept something that was as um, a directive that even a memorandum and framework would be um, in the Scottish context. Okay, thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you. Ross uh, convener, I'd like to just go back briefly to the convener's questions around uh, basic income or, or citizens' income. I welcome the fact that you mentioned that you've had discussions um, uh, around that. Are you aware of whether there will be a, a specific measurement of success in these trials in relation to, to artists or, or cultural impact? I'm not uh, close enough to be able to give you that information, but I'll find out from those that are... Uh, I think it's got... I know, I know Glasgow are looking at that in particular, um, and particularly in relation to, to artists. Um, I think Fife's another um, area they're looking at. I'm not sure whether they're looking at artists in particular, but we'll find out for you. And obviously, you're coming to the end of your inquiry, so we'll try and get something to you fairly quickly as to whether there's any measurements or anything specifically. I think it's the discussions more that it would be a good thing and applicable to artists as opposed to this pilot will measure... Mm -hmm whether it does have or not impacts on artists, but I will check because some of the work that Glasgow's doing may actually, either related to this or to do with their artist residences, might help. 
That'd be very useful. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, so to move on to another area, looking at um, funding, there's also been a lot of discussion, and, and to a significant extent, uh, this in inquiry comes off the back of um, issues with Creative Scotland regular funding that are not unrelated to uh, challenges with national lottery. So uh, sustainable replacements to lottery funding is an issue that came up quite a bit. And a number of submissions that were made highlighted uh, the Scottish National Investment Bank um, and suggestions around uh, the role that, that it could have. Um, their, dr the draft cultural strategy does also mention the, the SNB and, and the potential for, for it to play a role. Would you be able to detail at the moment any discussions that you've had with the, the finance secretary and, and what aspirations you have given that the intention is for the bank to become operational next year? A, a couple of things. I, I think we need to be clear that the Scottish National Investment Bank would be uh, operating in a commercial um, aspect, so it therefore would not be funding on a grant basis. Um, so therefore, the limitations would be to creative industries, I would expect. There have been discussions between the Creative Industry Advisory Group, which I co-chair um, with Bob Last. Uh, he also, he's had uh, discussions with uh, the Scottish National Investment Bank about the scope and possibilities. And I think there's, there's far more opportunities potentially within that. I can't give you detail because obviously they're developing their frameworks. Um, there's more opportunities there. I think it, it was quite, uh, there was a, a notice from, I think it was Aberdeen City Council suggested that somehow you could uh, replace national lottery funding with Scottish National Investment Bank. I thought that was really odd because um, one, a couple of things. One, don't give up on national lottery. Um, you know, I think that's the other, I think it's really important, especially when they're about to go out um, in future years for um, their new tender contracts and all the rest of it. But don't think that all of a sudden there's a slippery slope and there'll be no more arts funding. If you do that, then that gives that gives the red light to people to say, well, it should just go into society, um, social funding or sports funding, or whatever. So I think it's really important, whatever you do in, in, in your report, I would urge you, don't give up on national lottery. I think the, the concerns we've had is the volatility, the competition. Uh, we've made it quite clear in our um, correspondence with the, the UK government that we expect them to make sure that you know, whatever decisions they take to make it you know, as competitive as possible. The 25th anniversary will raise the profile of that, so we're, we're hoping that there'll be improvements. There have been stability in recent years, uh, which is helpful, and not to the level that we can, um, you know, uh, we think our 6.6 .6 million support to, to Creative Scotland at this stage, but, you know, it's been fairly, fairly, fairly level. But national lottery funding, by and large, had been used for grant purposes, um, for art, for art's sake, apart from, I think, Creative Scotland at some point will have been using it for film in particular, but even within film, it would be for um, art film as opposed to necessarily that that can be seen in a competitive way. National lottery funding is very tightly, uh, tightly uh, regulated. So it would be inappropriate. On, it's almost like if you had a spectrum of funding, is, is always looked at between what is about commercial and what is just in, ter in terms of um, you know, art for art, art's sake. You know, national lottery would be sitting at this end and the, anything you got from the National Investment Bank would be looking at the more commercial creative industry. So I, I, I would caution... Um, you know, how, you, how you approach that. Taking on board what you said about the uh, the bank will operate commercially, of, of course, the debate's ongoing at the moment. In fact, I think it was uh, being discussed yesterday morning um, in relation to the underlying purpose of the, the bank, which is part of the, the, the enabling legislation going through at present. Did you have any discussions with the finance secretary around cultural purpose? Um, I haven't had the direct conversations with the finance secretary, but we have had engagement with the actual bank itself in terms of its um, development. Uh, I, I, I always thought it was a long-term patient capital focusing on low carbon. I think the opportunity for culture and the low carbon agenda is really um, is really opposite. I do think that uh, there's things we can do. I mentioned in the chamber just yesterday in questions that uh, Historic Environment Scotland has just, together with California, launched uh, a climate heritage network, which uh, which is as much about culture as well as heritage, in that they want to see uh, culture and heritage being part of a solution. So there is something around... Um, looking at things in that context and the low carbon economy for the Scottish National Investment Bank. But um, I think we've got to be realistic. If you're operating in the commercial area, I think there are, are opportunities, particularly for the creative industries and those on the, on the creative side of things. I think looking particularly at the, the National Investment Bank, we're interested in some of the, I suppose it's the smaller funding. How do you do smaller funding for smaller organisations, which has always been a challenge when creative industries can frequently have difficulties with traditional banks. Um, so the opportunities are there but um, this has been something in terms of our you know, we've, we've 
because the Creative Industries Advisory Group, that again is a, a, a group of individual artists who are actually involved and directly involved, uh, we wanted to make sure that that engagement was direct with the National Investment Bank and uh, uh, the meetings took place with um, the former uh, um, uh, chair in terms of the development, Benny Higgins in, in particular. So those discussions have been taking place and quite constructively as well. Um, so we are actively in, engaged, but I'm, say, I'm not saying that I've directly done it with the Financial Secretary. I've just gone direct to the Scottish National Investment Bank via, with colleagues from the Creative Industries Advisory Group. Thanks. And, and just finally, you mentioned a minute ago, you obviously can't go into details right now about the specific proposals that the advisory group have been discussing with the bank, but given the intention is for the bank to be operational next year, could you give even an indicative timescale for when proposals could come forward and, and would be available for scrutiny? I, 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 can't, I can't, not at this stage, because I think that's a, actually that is a matter for the National Investment Bank itself. It's not for me to, to set that out. Perhaps be useful for us to, to write to them, but we can discuss that later. Yeah, I think that might be helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, one of the things that's come up in this inquiry has been the issue of the percentage for arts in a proposal. It's, uh, it's an operation in Ireland, which we heard about last week. It's an operation in Jersey and uh, some, uh, in some EU uh, countries. Um, is this uh, a scheme that the Scottish Government uh, have considered for implementing? Um, it's operational in a number of countries. I think Brazil did it at the time of their World Cup and the Olympic Games um, for, for new, new properties in development. Um, I suppose because of the period that we've gone through in terms of recession, pressures on construction, trying to make sure that we get uh, buildings uh, produced, that it probably hasn't been a main focus for us um, over recent years. Uh, but it is interesting in looking at uh, what Ireland has done and being able to do now. But of course, remember the level of GDP and growth that they have is considerably uh, stronger than we our position and in terms of the profits that we're making um, by different companies that allows them a bit more latitude in what they're doing. So I think the principle of it, yes, we're interested in, but in terms of have we done anything about it at this stage? No, but I think, you know, if we can get a period of sustained economic growth and in particular in construction. And I think if you again look at the culture strategy, the focus we know from the draft that places a big focus on that, that I think there are opportunities going forward with it. So... Um, certainly, on the back of uh, Ross Greer's uh, questions regarding the, the National Lottery, um, could you see this type of scheme as being something in addition to uh, the funding that comes into the creative sector uh, via the National Lottery? I'm always looking at things that are additional. <laughs> mm. I don't think we should necessarily look at things that are re replacements. So I think everything, and that's why it, it's really important that you don't just look at the kind of the straight bottom line of the culture budgets it's what we can generate from elsewhere and i've referred to some of the the city deals and i think it's quite obvious that there's a demand from local authorities in different areas to make sure that culture provision is 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 important and is, is you know seen as part of that so i think anything that's additional so i would see it as a, in addition i think these sort of schemes however tend to um, operate best when there are, there is funding from the government in some form so it's like match funding or whatever to help incentivize people to, to do it i think if you made it compulsory you'd have to probably have some kind of regulation or legislative underpinning because otherwise people could say no we're not doing it um, and again everything's in context uh, you'll probably be aware how congested not necessarily this committee but most of the committees and the parliament are with legislation and particularly at this stage in a parliamentary term so i think we'd have to look at you know the space and time for whatever regulations or legislation would be required for it uh, would you foresee any any challenges uh, to introduce this um, as a consequence also with the, with the powers that the scottish government currently have uh, as compared to those that are still reserved to westminster would there be any challenges there to bring this in I think because we're not, as I said, actively looking at it just now, we haven't done that work in terms of saying what is devolved and what's reserved as to pose what we would need to do to enable it. But that's something that um, you know we could look at at some point. But I'm just saying we're not actively looking at it at this stage. Uh, and uh, you mentioned that the city deal uh, projects, um, certainly across the, uh, the wider uh, Glasgow uh, region, and that's over uh, 1.1 uh, billion pounds of. Uh, of uh, capital investment to go in. Um, if, uh, if the scheme were to be introduced into, uh, into that particular region, um, there's, there's a possibility that the, 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 neg well, the effect uh, across some of the communities, particularly some of the smaller communities, it could be hugely advantageous in terms of the, the creative arts 
uh, and the uh, and then engaging with maybe some communities that uh, that, that maybe have felt left out um, in the past. Um, is, is this something that that, uh, that you think would uh, could be advantageous for? If the, if if the schemes are um, involving the local communities to decide what they want, where they want it, what the process is, and and that's what the best uh, projects are. Actually, I mean to be fair, some of the national lottery ones, and particularly now, they're very keen on making sure that it's community engagement right from the start in terms of what's involved. Uh, so I think in terms of representing your your place, I, I, so I'm just thinking about the the steel roses that we have in in, in Western Inch, my own constituency. You know, three thousand new houses built on the site of the British Leyland uh, car factory and how they wanted to represent the connection with the past but say this is something new and the uh, sort of consultation with the locals that came up with these wonderful artworks of um, that connected the steel but also of the cars but also with the with the flowers of the future and um, so that kind of thing c c can work absolutely in engaging people and particularly in visual art and what I would caution a bit about is uh, there is a focus particularly in city deals on capital um, and although th there might be artworks produced, and particularly for artists, and people can get involved in that, um, a lot of the city, uh, if, in that process about the percentage art and public art in places, a lot of the city deal proposals are for, uh, understandably, for theatres or for, for physical uh, structures. The challenge with building new things is that they need running costs and revenue to maintain them. And what you're not having necessarily as part of this is revenue as part of that. So the one thing I would... I would um, I welcome and, as you've probably seen, uh, have managed to secure capital funding for lots of uh, different cultural venues and different uh, areas, is don't lose sight um, of the fact that we need revenue as well as capital. Um, as that's just my cautionary advice. Uh, and just my, my final question, just um, it was th this, uh, this proposal came uh, to the committee um, from a, a group in my constituency uh, called Reg Arts. And it was a project, but they, they were working with um, River Clyde Homes uh, in, a, in a regeneration project uh, in Greenock in the Broomhill area, um, an area that had uh, basically no investment for some 40 years. And the, so although the project didn't come around uh, through the percentage for art scheme, um, thankfully River Clyde Homes actually had the foresight to engage uh, with a cultural organisation and uh, a creative organisation to actually help uh, engender that spirit of of ownership within the community and um, so when Reg, uh, when Reg Arts put this suggestion forward uh, to the committee um, when we had the initial day down in air, uh, generally thought it was something that uh, is worthwhile considering and um, and also if, if you have that opportunity to actually engage with either the wider community but also with organisations uh, within, a, within a community then uh, there certainly can be that the, the, the overarching benefit for everyone concerned. You, you'll have seen from the draft of our cultural strategy that you know, uh, transforming, empowering uh, are two of the three features uh, of the underlying principles of what we want to see in Scotland. And you know, and you're given a very good example of that kind of opportunity to transform local areas, but also empower uh, local communities through the power of art. You know, and I, that's something I, I'd like to see as the norm. So you, my vision would be to ensure that everybody, whether it's the public, private sector, would see it as, as natural and normal and expect, expect, expected that you would involve cultural, uh, cultural organisations in the work that you're doing. Um, I think that's the issue coming back to, do you have a legislative, regulatory, you must have 1% on public, or do you make it culturally the norm that people want to, to, to do that? And increasingly you're seeing it being done on a voluntary basis in this country. Um, but I think we can... See, you know, we'd want to see more of that and I think again having the power of um, the culture strategy to engage with other areas within government and beyond like planning organisations or indeed development companies um, to give best practising if you're doing this this is the best way to, to try and uh, achieve it and if it helps them you know, sell more houses um, you know, in terms of new town areas or whatever, then that's a good thing for them as well. So it's a win-win. So it's just the spirit of that. So can, you know, thank the organisation for bringing that to, to attention in a very practical way. Thank you. Mike. Thanks, um, Cabinet Secretary, your, your budget is quite a small part of the overall Scottish budget, and that's un understandable. Um, and you're quite positive in trying to lever in private funding to supplement, and, and you're looking out with your, your own budget, and you're working and trying to work with local authorities, as we've just heard. But what about, um, I'm just conscious that we might be in a situation where government, I mean, the Scottish government, may be looking at things in silos, 
And um, what I'm suggesting is that, have you had any sort of direct um, discussions or direct meetings, for instance, with the Cabinet Secretary for Education? Um, because he has a much bigger budget. Uh, you have a youth art strategy. I mean, you know, is it, is it, is it, it might be under the, it might be under a budget headline education, but it's culture and arts, isn't it? So have you had any direct discussions? Yes, the, an the answer is yes. And I, I think you're absolutely right that the most effective way of doing things is not to do things in style, but to actually mm. to look at for opportunities right across different portfolios. So we do that, for example, with justice. Um, you've seen that with uh, cashback uh, contributions uh, that come through there. On, I've had uh, fairly regular meetings with uh, Mr Swinney. You know, as, you, as you might be aware, there's obviously an issue with some local authorities and music tuition. I've got a very keen interest in that. And obviously, in terms of protecting the youth music initiative, um, that's culture funded. But obviously, we're trying to work, and local authorities are trying to work to see how they can make the most of the funding that they have within their area. Um, the youth arts, obviously, is a very strong part of uh, what we do uh, in terms of encouraging young people themselves to help shape Time to Shine as the youth arts strategy uh, was very much developed within for young people. Um, but I think if you look at the um, ed education side, there's two sides of it. There's actual cultural provision within education, within schools. There's also the skills area. So we also work on, you know, it's not just the schools part, it's the work with Skills Development Scotland and the creative skills um, aspect as well. Um, but it's re really important that um, it's not just about culture, it's also about creative of learning which is separate but related so those those strands within his brief are really important and trying to leverage in support for funding yes i do it and do it regularly mm. i mean even even over the over the larger aspect of uh, looking at his particular portfolio of the curriculum for excellence has come in for a lot of let's say a controversy at the moment but the principles of it are, are great it gives it gives a lot of flexibility to schools uh, uh, to teachers um, and there's a lot of opportunity to cover culture and arts within that um is any account taken in, in you know when you report on how much is spent in scotland on the arts not just looking at your budget but it, it, what i'm trying to say is is it a true reflection of what we actually spend yeah. on arts i I think it's a really good point. Um, if you were just doing it on pounds and pence, you'd be looking at something that's much smaller. I think if you looked at impact, and that's what the National Performance Framework is, we should be measuring by impact, not just by inputs. And I think that's the, the point there. Your point about curriculum for excellence, I think, is, is really important because you've got two three-year phases, yeah, uh, and that provides more opportunity to have more experience of different subjects, which is also, and if you take um, music, for example, um, the numbers that are taking higher music now in Scotland have escalated quite considerably. I think that's come from a number of issues. I think the Youth Music Initiative is proving you know, its worth in terms of interesting people um, uh, when they're younger. Uh, you're obviously always going to get people who will always want to do music and National Five and, uh, and higher music. But allowing that opportunity to do um, not just music, but other art subjects uh, in year three to whet the appetite, get interest in, in your third year then maybe not take it as one of your core subjects for your fifth year, but take it in sixth year. Means that compared, for example, to England, if you do the kind of, it's difficult to compare because they've got A-levels, et cetera. But in comparison, um, in terms of the direction, the, the percentage, and again, we've got a reducing number of young people um, currently in the cohort but if you look at percentages it's really strong and i think that's where um, actual cultural provision and uh, com combination works and of course it's about creative if we're looking for uh, young people who are creative innovative uh, sees things in context there's such an important role for culture in making people think differently and it goes back to the point i made about even tackling cli climate change uh, you know, helping people understand big, difficult concepts and the practical things that we're all going to have to do to change. Thinking differently is absolutely crucial as part of that, and that's what I think culture does um, in, in the school base. I mean, it's all about my, my final point. Really, is it's just all about joined up government. And I just, I, I am new to the committee, and I'm only come into this inquiry late, so I haven't heard all the witnesses, but I've been reading it through. And one thing that we do is compare. There's a lot of information compared what we spend in Scotland to other, other countries, and it's been very interesting reading that. Um, but I just wonder, are we comparing apples and oranges? Because it's very easy to look at your budget and say, well, that's what we spend on cu culture and arts. But as you've just indicated, actually a lot more is happening and can be happening outside. It's, it's difficult to quantify. Yeah. I, I agree, and I, th I think that's the, the challenge is that... Uh, 
we have a sector which tell me that they are pleased what I've managed to do in terms of protecting our funding bu budget, but probably as importantly, they've been confident to do brave things culturally and artistically, um, and actually in, in terms of uh, being able to see in advance and, and you know plan things uh, going forward. And that I am told by other countries that they look enviously to Scotland that we've got a vibrant cultural provision. And if you were to look at the num surely the numbers of my culture budget, you'd probably say that's not possible because you look at the reductions or whatever. So that's why it's really important. And if you genuinely believe that culture is the centre of society in so many different ways, as we have with our national performance outcome, which is the first time we've, we've had that, um, it's only a re recent addition, it means everybody else has to contribute to it and we have to contribute to everyone else. And I think that's the real measure. So the I, I think what will be interesting is when committees, um, dare I say this might be sacrilege, just was, is, uh, you move as much from uh, budget scrutiny as the, in, you know, the inputs in terms of uh, the funding, but actually look at scrutiny of the national performance framework outcomes um, and take evidence from different committee, uh, from different cabinet secretaries on the different outcomes and do it in a cross, never mind us working in a cross-cutting way, but actually the committee's doing it, which might be a, a, a different agenda for you going forward. Sorry, I should, I should have probably gone into that territory. I'm, I'm just there. The <laughs> <laughs> I'll blame Mike Rumbles. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Alexander Stewart. <coughs> cabinet Secretary, in your opening statement, you talked about the, the benefits uh, the value and the challenges facing the, the sector uh, and its funding. Uh, and there's no doubt that over the last decade uh, there has been a decline and many organisations, individuals and local authorities have looked at new ways of trying to manage that uh, so that they can realise the, their potential, so they want to maintain and sustain uh, their cultural or their arts programmes or their other facilities. Uh, so looking at all of that in the round, uh, what do you then consider to be uh, the purpose of the public arts funding itself? Well, the purpose of arts funding is to help ensure that we've got uh, support for individual artists uh, to produce art for art's sake, but to also provide opportunities for um, individuals and communities to enjoy and embrace um, you know, cultural activity themselves, but also to experience great art. And then finally, the strand, I think, is to help support excellence in art as well. And I think we should never lose sight that uh, you know, at times when we're trying to put focus on community in place, you know, there is a role for public funding to support excellence in art. The, the sustainable investment of all of that, uh, how, how, that how that's managed uh, to ensure that there is the, the opportunity uh, for these organisations and these individuals uh, to have that. So, so do you think that there should be some sort of baseline level uh, ac across the pieces? Is that something that's been considered by the government as a, as a way of tackling and looking at things? I, I, I'd rather look at ceilings rather than floors. And I think there's a danger if you have baselines that, you know, some, somebody who's taken a very, you know, I suppose finance accounts, look at this uh, sitting in the finance department might just say, well, that's all you need. <laughs> so therefore that's all you're getting. And I, I actually think that's maybe not the right approach. I think it's, uh, I, I think what's probably as important is sustainability and regular aspect. And, you know, and I, you know, I think I've been straight with the, the committee that there are financial challenges have been and there will be going forward. Um, so you know, we may have to look again at some of, of what we've been doing in, in, in the past. And you know, again, your advice from the committee is going to be really important in looking at what you think is the main focus. But if you take, for example, the national performing companies, um, what has been as important to them is giving them certainty um, because certainty allows them to plan ahead. Uh, it's uncertainty that causes difficulty in terms of confidence for not just you know the private sector investment, actually culturally for people to plan and what they're doing, and and so therefore when you talk about sustainable funding, you know, you'll hear it time and time again, you know trying to have more multi-year funding streams is really really important because that provides that stability and confidence, um, and that's I think what we would really like to see more of, and I think going back to, and this is where you know if you, you're taking the point that Claire Baker was making earlier on about working with local authorities, you know doing things on a three year basis with local authorities saying you know as part of this this is what we want to do, um, you know a lot of it's you can't dictate you know in terms of the cultural contribution but you can see what you'd want in terms of audiences artists etc, 
that would be an ideal, you know, if you're an ideal sustainable way. So I think it's the, the method of doing it is as important as the actual quantity of funding. But the bottom line is, if you haven't got the cash and resource to do it, it's very difficult. And as you probably hear from others, including Creative Scotland, um, obviously there are winners and losers. Um, and you know, the point that the, I suppose the, the convener was saying about artists as they progress in their work, you know, not all artists will always be always be successful and at the work throughout their career. How do you create space for new companies or new organisations to come in? And that is where you know we should not be part of this at all. That's where you know the professional judgment of those that are that, that are um, you know artist professionals can can take a judgment. And that's where I know you're looking at peer review and different other things in that. And all of that's vitally important and the, the Cultural Commission themselves gave some examples uh, about what they would expect and what they thought would be the best ways of managing some of that. And you've identified uh, that if you are looking at a programme uh, to try and create, create that over a, a number of years is the best way to manage that uh, rather than just living from hand to mouth uh, about how you manage that process. So in thinking about how we, we want to uh, and uh, the evidence we've taken in the and the, the, the results we're going to give uh, coming from this inquiry will we'll, we'll lead the way uh, as to how things should hopefully improve uh, for the industry and for the sector and for some of these individuals. So in looking at that, what do you see are the, are the main uh, objectives and also the main challenges of trying to achieve that so that we do get that crossover, that we do get that opportunity of individuals to cover uh, the whole sector and the baseline rather than just putting specific funding into specific areas uh, that may not uh, uh, develop as, as time goes on. But we, I don't think as parliamentarians we know, right? No. So I, I think that's why the arm's length principle is important. And some of the issues around uh, irregular funding has been three-year funding. Uh, the problem is all, it's, it's almost like it's, it all happens at once. And so every three years, there's been you know, a real issue. Now, that I know that there's a review from Creative Scotland into you know, the, their funding streams and how they do things. I know the committee's taken a keen interest. But if you always have, you know, um, you know, instead of having a yearly crisis, you know, every three years, because there will be winners and there will be losers. And, you know, it's just how fair it is and how transparent, et cetera, that people accept the decisions um, that are made. I mean, there is a case that, uh, you know, different art forms shouldn't necessarily all be done at the same time and that you do a rolling programme. Um, that might be a way of actually, you know, resolving the peaks and troughs of, of how, how people see that. Um, but I also think there's genuinely an issue. Um, and, I, and I come back to this, you know, a lot of local authorities have been really, really good in the the cultural funding and actually despite pressures I've done it really well and I've said and I, I'm if you look at local government funding it's actually tourism that is the bulk of the culture and related reduction it's not necessarily culture and heritage and um, um, and so I, I would commend them in, in doing that but regular revenue funding for arts organization and artists is more challenging I think local authorities find it easier to focus on places and buildings and I think if there was a message to come from the committee I think uh, I would repeat the point revenue funding is really important both at national level but also at local level thank you thank you very much Annabelle Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you, you referred a moment ago uh, in passing to the issue of peer review, and obviously that's an issue that the committee has taken evidence on. And indeed, from the evidence that we have received, there does appear to be some uh, <laughs> popular support for some form of peer review. Uh, I'm not sure if you had, uh, if the Cabinet Secretary has had the opportunity to look at the um, record of our meeting last week, where we had a very interesting uh, session with. Uh, Orla McBride of the Art, uh, Arts Council of Ireland and I had asked her about how the peer review system works in Ireland and it uh, was a very interesting discussion. Um, it seems very well organised, thought through. It has a lot of buy-in from applicants in terms of it being fair and robust. Um, it seems that there is uh, some 60 to 70 peer review panels that meet uh, uh, every year. Uh, and um, that certainly Orla McBride felt that it was uh, it was a system that was uh, working. They keep it under review. Um, and I just wondered to what extent uh, there has been any discussion with Creative Scotland about uh, uh, reintroducing uh, a form of peer review system into arts funding in Scotland? <coughs> well, it's something that um, I have discussed with them. That, well, actually, it, probably they've discussed with me. They've, 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 they've said that what, they're, what they're looking at. 
Um, they have used peer review uh, to some extent. They used it in recent uh, open funding uh, uh, in particular, and that uh, obviously freed up opportunities for um, Creative Scotland to look at other um, areas that they were focusing on. Um, so that it's, not, it's not that they ha haven't done it, they just haven't done it as extensively as perhaps in the previous Art Council, or indeed, as, you, as you're suggesting, in Ireland. There are pros and cons of peer review working. Obviously, as you mentioned, some of the, the, the pros are particularly the buy-in and the respect for the decision-making, etc. I would say that there is also a great deal of respect for the individuals within Creative Scotland and their professionalism and their experience in what they're doing, and I want to put that on record. Um, the pros for it, it obviously spreads decision-making, uh, responsibility to relevant experts, and also, as you mentioned, contributes to that credible and defensible decision-making process. I would say, and this is where it's probably worth probing further, is that it is costly and time-consuming um, to keep it regularly fit for purpose. And obviously, I think that's probably what you heard from Ireland, is that actual the management of that system needs fairly regular um, attention. Um, there is a kind of different point about um, all the different art forms, making sure you've got a wide enough pool of experts, so it's not just the same individuals, because obviously in a small country like Scotland, you know, everybody knows everybody and what you don't want, and this is where your peer reviews that don't work well, is because um, there's concerns about personal connections and all the rest of it, and potential criticisms of that. And, uh, you know, it's, the issue is about fairness and transparency. Sometimes, you know, you've got to take the judgment of peer reviews as opposed to necessarily it being something that's more obviously um, evaluated and transparent. So I think there's definitely uh, scope and room and potential to reintroduce um, more effective peer review working. However, uh, that has to be a recommendation from Creative Scotland itself. I don't think as a government minister I should be telling them what to do in terms of uh, how they should go about that business. No, I wasn't suggesting that. I just wondered if you'd had discussions with them. I mean, on, on certain of the issues you raised there, Cabinet Secretary, I mean, um, the point about um, there being a small pool in smaller countries, well, I mean, Ireland has 60 to 70 panels across all art forms uh, meeting every year. Uh, and I think um, that would be something that Creative Scotland perhaps could look at in more detail. I mean, it, it's not that it operates on an ad hoc basis. It actually is absolutely embedded into how the Arts Council <coughs> of Ireland approaches uh, uh, funding uh, and um, uh, we have and we've referred to this individual who gave us uh, oral evidence the jazz musician uh, in Scotland and he felt that it was very bizarre indeed that his applications were judged by people who had absolutely in his words no understanding at, at all of the jazz world and what he was seeking to do and he felt that that was not the optimal um, uh, approach and lastly on the issue of course I mean it may be that Creative Scotland again could uh, look into this in, in more detail and have perhaps discussions with the Arts Council of Ireland because I did raise the issue of course last week with Orla McBride and, and she <coughs> certainly in her response felt quite comfortable that the, the percentage spent on the course absolutely was outweighed by the benefits that they derived from that system so it, it may be that for Creative Scotland if they're listening today that they may wish to proactively mm -hmm. uh, have a look at that because certainly the evidence we are getting cabinet secretary is that people are really keen for this issue to be explored yeah. I think I think there's more pros seriously and, I think there's pros and cons and even uh, previously when there was a more extensive peer review working in Scotland it wasn't without its criticism so all I'm saying is caution you to, don't see it as a panacea and and save all because you know people who perhaps haven't had funding in the past think that peer, peer review will be the savior that will provide them with funding but even peer review there are winners and losers I think the issue is is that actually if people are being reviewed by the peers that have got, um, you know, it gives them some, uh, I suppose, confidence and credibility, but they can still be, the answer can still be no. Um, and I think that's always the problem when the answer is no. Uh, and we do have good, uh, as I said, uh, in terms of the uh, capability and the skills and professionalism that operate within Creative Scotland, that is recognised and they have to uh, be far more um, open and transparent in their funding review. And I think that's what they're planning to do when they release their, their changes. Um, but I think they'll hear very loudly what I've said and also what you've said in relation to peer review. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. <coughs> Who's next? Donald, Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I've got a few questions on uh, data gathering, but um, just returning to one of the issues that uh, I think Alexander Stewart raised uh, and you yourself have raised, which is uh, the phrase art for art's sake, which has been used. Uh, I was very pleased to hear, hear you say that because I think there has been in the past uh, from some commentators and some artists uh, criticisms of the Scottish Government directing 
uh, sort of cultural strategy. Um, and linked to that, we have certainly had um, e evidence, or at least discussions, uh, that sources of funding, be they uh, from private or commercial uh, bodies, be they local government or from central government, can um, influence or determine what, what is actually created. Um, and by implications of restrict artistic freedom. Can you reassure me that when we say art for art's sake, that that's not just a catchphrase and that the government at least has no desire to influence the creative direction of publicly funded art? I, I have no interest in uh, directing the creativity of any artist at all. Uh, I have been long and consistent in my approach on this. I'll send you a copy of the Talbot Rice lecture I gave, which I think was, uh, to, to me, the obvious thing to say, which is that you know, there should be separation, there should be independence of artists to create what they want. I've always championed that. Uh, I, I, what I was perhaps quite struck with when I made that speech was that uh, it seemed to be, it was, it was seen as a, a very refreshing and uh, pleasant and uh, uh, agreeable uh, statement for any government to, to make. But uh, the fact that people felt it had to be said and it was so important that it was said uh, gave me some indication that obviously there was previously there had been some concern about how government had worked previously. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to pay judgment on that. But I strongly believe, as I've done, in, in, whether it's academic independence or freedom of expression, I think is really, really important. Um, and that's, you, you might not have to like everything that's funded, but you certainly have to champion it. And uh, I think uh, when I, you know, I say that it's really important that we do uh, support arts for our sake it's it's because uh, going to the point about supporting excellence in whatever form to be able to to be realized i think there's also an important point and, and i caution um, about the transactional view always that culture has to do something for somebody else it can do it's additional but if you don't have that baseline of production and support for artists um, to do the work that they're doing, you'll never be able to have anything that can then be used in a transactional way in shape or form. So um, it's, it's both both and, but absolutely, you can, you, you as a country will not flourish unless you have a strong belief that um, art should exist in and of itself. Thank you for that. Um, can I then move on to the, the questions around evidence, uh, evidence-based policy making and, and data and the importance of data? Uh, I think it's fair to say that evidence for this inquiry indicated that it's difficult to find accessible data to build up uh, the full picture of arts funding and the outcomes of arts funding, both at a local and a national level in Scotland. We had some very interesting evidence last week, again from Ireland and also the, um, the EU uh, um, representative, um, about sort of measuring data, uh, etc. Do you, as a government, intend to establish the measuring change group that was uh, included, I think, in the draft culture strategy? So I'm not allowed to make announcements during a part of the election period, so the, uh, the strategy as it will appear yeah. after we, we, you know, when, when we're allowed to make those new announcements. But that was a very strong strand about how we could measure um, performance and change. And I think it goes back to the point I think that Mike Rumbles was making as well. It's the impact of it as well, not just the inputs. And I think that's going to be really important. Um, obviously, a lot of the observatories, I think you've taken evidence of, you know, some of the concepts of that came out of UNESCO back in the, the 90s. And I was interested that the um, data gathering and the observation that takes place in Ireland is actually funded from the Research Council, which again will be independent from government. So there's ways of doing these things that can have, um, you, you, again, each country will probably do it in, in a way that suits them, but it's a direction of travel that I'm very much interested in. Okay. Helpful. I, I appreciate the, the, your, your, the restrictions on you at the moment, but, but you, you can um, acknowledge the, the issues around data and, and, and the fact that it's, it's critical, it seems to me, yeah. to, to achieve uh, as much data as we can. Yes, but um, at a, but but again, I would caution. It comes back to everything that's involved with managing of the system, whether it indeed it's peer review or of its data gathering. It goes back to the. Uh, uh, the convenience point at the beginning, if it's not money that's going direct to artists, then there's a question mark over it. So mm -hmm. that's the thing. I, I don't want to be gathering data at the expense of money, having to mm -hmm. take budgets away from artists to put into uh, expensive and extensive data gathering. So that's the balance that you always have to get. If it can make an impact, as I said, in, in, in smarter working to give more funding to artists, then yes, um, that's important. But it's, if it's uh, dare I say, data gathering for its own sake, it's not something that I think is important. I think it's for a purpose. And that's where that's that's what I would want to see. Thank you, thank you. Camille. Thank you, Kenneth Gibson. Okay, thank you.
Convener, good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Y you said in your response to Alexander Stewart that there was a, a need to support individual artists. And uh, when we were out uh, taking evidence, uh, we met a number of uh, young people who were trying to get started in the creative arts. And what was interesting was the disparity in experience. So, for example, we heard that um, uh, students from Glasgow School of Art apparently don't get any support um, when they leave um, GCA in terms of um, advice on how to set up uh, in the arts, how to, for example, rent properties, how to get tax advice, you know, how to actually um, address that daunting task, whereas Ayrshire College does actually give that sort of advice and support. So if someone wants to be, you know, a sculptor or a photographer or a painter, they don't just walk out there and think, what do I do next? They actually get some support and help to do that. So I'm just wondering where the Scottish Government um, it, it, it would look at um, perhaps trying to widen that to uh, enable people who may other who may be talented but may flounder in terms of the practicalities of getting into um, a, a, a career in the arts uh, to, to provide more support in, in that regard. Um, I think that's a very interesting point. I mean, I actually remember having some discussions with the, the former um, principal um, director, uh, Tom Innes, uh, some time ago at GCA. And at that time, they were showing the uh, stats in relation to employability. And actually, well, employability, but obviously, question mark on what rates and what pay, etc. But actually, the uh, figures for GCA were extremely strong. And in fact, one of the best across all the different institutions. So that kind of contradicts a bit that they're not necessarily having the skills to do it. Um, it's a subject that we've taken keen interest on in the Creative Industry Advisory Group um, that I, that I co-chair. And indeed, one of the last sessions that we had uh, was with um, the Funding Council in terms of uh, what type of education funding or, or what you know what their, their focus is and how do they keep in touch with what the industry needs, etc. And you get some of the views from the Creative uh, Industry Advisory Group itself was actually that for youngsters, they'd much prefer that they had the natural, um, I don't say natural, but the skilled professional training within their art form because some of the practicalities and some of the kind of practicalities of doing the business they can then do when they're actually working with them. Um, what you're probably talking about is more entrepreneurial as in setting up their own practice in their, their own area. So I'm kind of slightly surprised because that conflicts with what I'm told is part. In fact, if anything, I get complaints there's too much of that and not enough on actual art practice and the actual practice of art um, in the art colleges. So it's an area, again, going back to uh, Mike Rumble's point, that uh, because obviously I'm not responsible for the institutions, um, the, the art colleges are part of higher education, further education, but we've got a keen interest on it. And that's where working with uh, Skills Development Scotland and the Funding Council, making sure that in terms of what the needs of the creative industries are, um, they're very much reflected in, in, in the type of provision. Now, again, um, universities and the art colleges are independent institutions, uh, but what I did manage, again, in discussions with the Cabinet Secretary for Education was to ensure in his letter of guidance um, to the Funding Council for the first time they included provision as taking into account the specific needs of the creative industries, or words to that effect. Um, so that was precisely to make sure that they were staying as close, that the, um, the type of um, funding that's given, uh, particularly from uh, research from um, Scottish Funding Council can be focused a lot on what we would see as uh, research, understandably for STEM, etc. Research in the basis of, of arts is actually art practice, it's not lab work. Um, how do you make sure that, you know, uh, in terms of the funding streams that are given to institutions, they reflect what they need? There are particular issues in relation to the Royal Conservatoire, for example, and, uh, and again, there's been far more closer working, and I've helped enable that um, or facilitate it. I can't direct because government, you know, again, you've got academic freedom in institutions, but the point about what students need, but also what the industry needs from students, um, means that there has to be a closeness and understanding. And I think one of the things that the very successful things, the Creative um, Industries Advisory Group, as I said, there's, uh, you know, there's individuals represent each of the indi individual art forms, has helped try and direct that as well. So I think you have got a point. I think there's something around how institutions listen to young people themselves and how they listen to recent graduates as to what's worked or not, and they need to be responsive. But I, I can't reflect on those discussions because obviously I, I wasn't part of them, but I was quite surprised by what you said. Yeah, I mean, obviously, other colleagues were actually there at the, at the same, uh, um, you know, visit, and uh, 
what, what I'm saying basically came directly from the mouths of the students yeah. themselves, obviously. Uh, I think in terms of GSA, um, probably employability is high because it's a prestigious institution. That, um, but there are other people who felt that, you know, they, they were effectively, once they went out the door, they thought, now what? You know, basically, how do I actually end up working in, in, in the field in which I've spent a number of years actually le learning learning my craft? And, and so it's just about ensuring that people who do have talent don't fall through these cracks and end up working in a completely different field and end up feel, finding frustrated because the talent that they obviously have is that they're not able to commercialise. And so it's really about... Um, it, about trying to ensure that talent isn't wasted effectively and that we do actually make the most of the skills and talents uh, from our, our creative um, 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 community. And I think it's particularly difficult for younger people. I mean, if you're, you're coming out of an institution when you're, you know, 20 or something like that and you don't know anybody, for example, you might come from a deprived community or something, you don't really know anyone who runs a business or um, who has entrepreneurial skills. And it's about, I, I do think it can be very daunting. So it's just about how to ensure there's a wee bit of belt and braces where possible, even in discussion with the colleges, not necessarily directly from the government itself, but to, to try and ensure that that doesn't happen to, if we're going to optimise the, the skills of a creative sector going forward. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think the your point you're making about making sure that it's more diverse is really important because it is a, an area that is, it, it feeds off networking. Um, and if it becomes self-replicating by those that know and you know, and, and there's a class issue in this, and we know that. Um, so that's why there are a number of programmes um, and supported from Creative Scotland on um, an inclusive programme, and also with, so particularly in screen sides, but it needs to be in other areas. How do you give opportunities to people from non-traditional backgrounds to get into this area? And I think that's really, really important. Um, and that's something that I push back and challenge as to what we're doing, because again, in terms of our letters of guidance, inclusivity and diversity is very much part of what we're doing. And, and if, we, if we believe um, that creative uh, industries in Scotland and has a strong future. If we understand it's the fastest growing growth sector in the whole of the UK, then we need to make sure that we've got a pipeline um, of successful people coming forward and they don't fall out the system too quickly and too early. So at the, one of the things that we do, we are doing as part of our programme, this is, this is a good strong area that we're looking at um, with our, the, the, the CIA colleagues is what can we do with Skills Development Scotland and the Funding Council to make sure there's tailor-made support that's more particular for you know, those that are coming through that have to set up very... The most entrepreneurial people you often will meet will be artists because they've got to do exactly what you're saying is start from scratch, often on their own. They're not part of a big organisation. Sometimes bringing people together and the networking is really important. And going back to some of the kind of issues with local authorities, you know, you're seeing, you know... Um, uh, growth on and huge demand for artist studios. Some of the best ways for you know peer support and networking to understand how you do things is bringing artists together. So I, I think one of the big areas that we could support our individual artists in is, is, is encouraging local authorities in different areas to develop artist studios or, or you know use of what would have previously been high school um, you know high street shops or indeed. Um, other um, pre, you know, former industrial units and turning them into artist studios because that also can provide support. And if you were to do that together with pro providing mentoring skills, etc., you start to have a framework where people might not fall through the cracks. So these are all things that are probably, you know, far more a bit more detailed than I should necessarily go into as cabinet secretary. It's, I certainly feel very strongly about it, and that is in keeping with what we're doing in discussions with our creative industries advisory group. But I'll let them know that the committee is interested. Okay, and just just lastly. I mean, first of all, well, first of all, and that last point, um, I, I do recall how successful some of the collective art studios were in Glasgow back in the 1980s, and the, you know the Wasp Studios. But just this last thing, could be, you know, one other thing um, is the issue of geography, which we touched on before. I mean, um, in evidence from Creative Scotland, um, um, we saw the figures that, for example, the, the, the grant award in Glasgow is 25 times per capita what it is in North Ayrshire. Now, we obviously expect the cities to have a higher per capita spend because they have national companies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you have a, a, you know, that kind of level of differential, it is quite 
horrendous and I, know, I still think more work has to be done to ensure that there's a, a more even basis of grant distribution in Scotland and more encouragement and engagement to try and get um, cultural groups within places like North Ayrshire and indeed other parts of Scotland. Fife has also been touched on, for example, in, in, in the evidence we've taken um, to, to, to ensure that the, that the, the money that's um, spent on arts um, is more evenly spread across Scotland. Uh, I understand exactly what you're, you're saying, because uh, obviously there are a number of local authorities that don't have any funding um, for Creative Scotland. Now, they're not there to fund local authorities, they're there to fund, and it goes back to the point about, you know, is the excellence or the contribution and the capability. And as I've just you know, referred to networking, and you know, artists would tend to network and, and you know, gravitate to each other. That's why the cities have always traditionally been the place that artists will gather. However, I do think that um, there needs to be an understanding that place is really important and excellence excellence can come from anywhere um, and therefore you know in terms of that geographic spread it's something that you know I think it's really important but if you end up having a quota system I think you then take the lifeblood out of what you're funding in terms of what the artistic opportunities are um, not all um, although uh, organizations might be funded um, and located in one area and you take Edinburgh for example there are companies that are funded in Edinburgh and they work all over the, the country so it's where the impact is not just where they're located I'll give you an example um, also in terms of the geography can be sometimes a bit odd the Cumnock Trist for example is supported but it's, it's registered as North Ayrshire when actually it obviously Cumnock's in East Ayrshire in terms of the operation because the applicant lives in North Ayrshire so there's some disparities there but I do think there's a recognition and I, I hope with the cultural strategy we can do that that is to, to make sure that we should nurture you know, a, a, a cultural activity and, uh, and excellence wherever you can find it. And certainly there's some really strong organisations that are doing great work in, in, in the south of Scotland. I, I visited over the, the summer a, a number of projects there. Um, and we need to, and part of our role is to make it more visible, some of the excellence that's happening right across the Scotland, not just in our cities. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Camille. Thank you very much. I'm just going to go back to Claire Baker. Well, um, thank you, convener. It's really to return to some of the questions that Stuart McMillan was asking earlier about overall um, budget and the national funding. Um, we had figures from SPICE that show that the grant and aid between 2010 and 2019 has declined. It's, the estimate has declined around 9.2 million. Um, so even though the Cabinet Secretary does legitimately argue that she's protected the budget, when we see in terms of the impact of inflation and we do see an overall reduction over years. Thinking about sustainable funding, is there an ambition within government to recognise we've seen this decline and how do, is there an ambition to reverse it and to increase funding into arts? I'm not arguing that you managed to deliver that in this budget, but is there a longer term strategy and ambition to see arts receive a greater share of the overall Scottish budget? Well, to to receive a greater share of the, the Scottish budget, you'd have to take it from somewhere else. And I've not seen this committee or any other committee suggest where that might, might come from. You know, would I like more money for the... This year, there's some consequentials. There's always little pots of money. You've got such a tiny budget. To increase it by something doesn't really require... You know, there's, there's announcements made all the time. It doesn't require a huge amount of budget to increase. Um, um, and whether uh, and it's not it's not an argument that this happens next year, or as Mike Rumble's asked about cross portfolio funding. It's just is there any, you know, longer? I'm talking longer term. You know, would there be an ambition? Is government looking to say well, in five years' time we would want to see arts funding or in ten? I suppose and other bit. countries use the kind of one percent model. That's the issue that. Um, right. That Stuart oh, I thought around. you meant one percent for buildings as opposed to one percent for actual. Uh, other ones you, use it as a, as a. We're back to the kind of baseline argument. It, the, but is there no plans for government to take that kind of approach? Do, do I want or, more money in the sorry. culture budget? The answer is yes. Will I get yes. that? That's a challenge, particularly when we've got other pressures elsewhere. And you'll know that in terms of uh, health, uh, you know, health has been you know, absolutely uh, protected. Uh, so has policing within justice. Now, if you take the size of the health budget is so big that that means all the other non-projected budgets have had to reduce to help continue to support that in pressured times. And that's the reality of it. Your point about um, you could put an absolute kind of commitment, uh, any government could to say, yes, we want to have 1% or, or X%, percent, uh, yes, we want over five years to increase it. Um, I could do that and try and I could maybe argue and get more funding actually in my budget line, but I would have to take it from other portfolios in other parts of the government 
um, particularly in the pressured funding that we're getting in terms of our grant uh, provision from, from the UK government. Um, and if I did that, I, I would risk getting the contribution that I can get from other budgets, the £35 million in the Tayside City deal for culture and tourism, or the £15 million from Sterling, or the money we can get from education and, and skills, etc. So your, your answer is right, and, and that might look very good on paper, and I could try and achieve it. But I have, and I think one of the reasons we've been, um, and I've been successful in our, our role in culture in, in, in Scotland <coughs> is that we've actually just been smart and pragmatic. And I, as long as I can ensure that there's funding, and I, I, am, I am less concerned about where it comes in from government than the amount that I can get in totality in terms of the areas. And if I fought just in a silo, as, as Mike Rumbles was, you know, if I just did it in silo, I think there's a risk that I might end up with a bigger line on my own budget, but not the same contribution to culture from other parts of the government. So I'd, I'd caution you just to say that it should all just be, be in my area. And, and maybe I, you know, that's just my approach. I think it's been fairly effective to date. And I think if I changed it, I might put at risk the absolute impact that we have and the money that goes in. And for example, even, even in our year of coastal and waters, we announced last week £770,000, most of which are artistic, artistic activity that will go into artists that will be performing all over the country, including, I think, in North Asia, but I'll check. But, um, you know, so I, I think you, I understand what you're saying, and I'm very tempted to go down that line, and I'd like to do that, but I think there are risks in doing it as well. Now, we are waiting for the culture strategy. Um, do you think the culture strategy, is that the vehicle for trying to leave it in additional funding across government? And do you see that as a way we discussed local authority engagement earlier? What are the, what's the ambition for what the cultural strategy can deliver in terms of long-term sustainable funding? So, so I'd caution that in and of itself, the cultural strategy will not be a, a major funding announcement. I don't think in the current constraints and the, the budgets that we have that, that necessarily that people would expect that. But your point about will it then be a statement of how we can work collectively across government and not even just government, but with... You know, with uh, local authorities, uh, with different arts organisations, but also with people outside of arts to help leverage in more funding? The answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, ju just to, to wrap up, um, one pressure on funding that we haven't talked about, we've talked about a number of pressures on funding, and that's uh, the, the impact of uh, Brexit. Um, Creative Scotland commissioned a UK consultancy company, Euclid, to uh, identify EU-funded projects focused on the arts and creative industries. And the report found that two-thirds of this funding had come from European structural funds rather than cultural-specific uh, programmes. But we also know through our work in this committee that Creative Europe um, also funds a, a, great, a great deal of uh, activity in, in Scotland. Indeed, we heard from Creative Europe an evidence session uh, last week. Um, can, are, is there anything you can share with the committee about the Scottish Government's plan for protecting or replacing funding uh, that's currently leveraged from EU sources, or is that just not possible in the current financial climate? Well, the, the, this is a, a, an area of frustration. I'm not sure if you, you have taken evidence on the, uh, the just announcement just, I think, last week in, in relation to what the uh, Scottish Government would want to see in relation to EU structural funds, and you, you're correct in identifying that a lot of the funding that has gone into culture and heritage from Europe is not necessarily as people might have anticipated from cultural leads, it's actually from structural funds, a bit like actually in, in Scotland how regeneration funds quite often end up in, in the cultural area as well. Um, We've got real concerns about the uh, lack of detail or any information at all around the UK's so-called Prosperity Fund, which is meant to be the replacement um, for funding in these areas. Um, the, there have been broad brush statements of, yes, we will guarantee funding from the UK government, but not how, how much and where, etc. The discussions we have had is in the administration of such funding, should it become available, how we would replace the administration of funding the projects that we've got. And I think there's four currently in terms of the Creative Europe ones, um, to give some kind of certainty as to how it would work. Um, for uh, the, the, the organisations that are involved. Uh, but I can't say 
and, and say to you now that any of that funding can be guaranteed because I'm not the UK government replacing it and they've just been very vague in saying what they would they would do in that area. So uh, it is of serious concern. It's one of the kind of major areas in, in relation to that. We don't want to, uh, we want to make sure that we don't lose out in terms of funding. Um, in any shape or form, we know how much we need and where it comes from. There's the media funding. There's, I think, understand 19, uh, it's either 19 million pounds or, or euros. It's one of those one of those figures in relation to Creative Europe. Um, and we know what those projects are, where they are. It's not all about, um, you know, the, I suppose, predictable either media programme or Creative Europe programme. When I was down in Wigton, you know, they're part of a Northern Periphery funding uh, programme with different kind of... Um, uh, book festivals uh, and uh, those in the literature area so it's of great concern and you know that, is, that does come back to the the politics of this is you know culture doesn't work in boundaries uh, the writers want to work with those that have got uh, great ideas uh, it's a way of us being internationalized um, and there's a great deal of goodwill i was in the unesco i spoke to a number of um, european culture ministers when i was there uh, there's a great desire for us to continue to be part of the programs you can be part of creative europe and not be part of the U european union for example um, but uh, there's my, my, my biggest concern are for the immediate, pro the immediate programmes that are live just now to make sure they continue with funding. So I will do my part uh, as part of that Brexit planning to try and ensure what I can. But it would be wrong with the Scottish Government to say it can mitigate all the worst excesses of what the UK Government has or has not done in terms of providing detail on this. Thanks very much. And I, I, I guess kind of a, con continuing the theme, I think we could all agree that, you know, you have been able to protect aspects of your budget, um, particularly the, the shortfall in terms of lottery, and you've you've come forward with extra money for film, which is much appreciated. But I think we're all agreed that the, you know there are considerable financial pressures, as we've discussed uh, today, um, and those pressures are felt in local government and in obviously on our, our, our Creative Scotland, our, our, our main arts agency, which I guess their RFO um, last year was what triggered. Uh, our inquiry in the first place. Um, so clearly, no matter what they do in terms of reviewing how they operate, there's still going to be continued pressures in, in terms of funding. So notwithstanding what you've talk, talked about in terms of the arm's length nature of the organisation, what discussions have you had with Creative Scotland about their review of how they operate funding and um, where it's going? They've obviously discussed with me the terms of the review, what they were trying to achieve. Um, they're also going through a management review also in terms of the organisation. Uh, I'm due to see Creative Scotland actually very soon and I was expecting that meeting um, uh, to receive more information about what they're planning in terms of the review, having seen, you know, having gone through the review, what that's going to mean in terms of their, their funding. What I did speak to them about more recently was to give them the space and time um, they've uh, given, you know, again, it's subject to future budgets, which we can't give them just now, but um, they're wanting to um, extend for a year the RFOs to give a bit more, so there's a, a bit of a smoother transition and not a cliff edge in relation to their move to the new funding system that they're going to develop. But I can't give you details i don't have them and actually it would be for them to give you as well Even a bit of the feedback about that around uh, actually just from locally rfo organizations who i think have been informed that, do, how does that work does it mean their funding would just be extended for another year based on previous year's funding is that how it's going to work um i think the i think the either it was either myself or creative scotland have written to the committee to to give them that information as far as i can remember but i'll make sure that they can share that with you how they intend to do that but it's to give you so to, to give uh, RFO with some certainty. So that's a public, I don't know if you've got that to hand uh, from officials, but we'll make sure that you, you have that. Okay. Um, it so is subject to budgets. Uh, and as is actually every grant letter to every organisation, whether it's Creative Scotland and National Performing Companies, it's always there. Have you got anything else on that, then, David? As you say, it's, it's, it's subject to budgets. The intention is that it's the stability of not having a new round of decision making about the portfolio for right. a further year. At the same time, yeah. then introducing a new system. Yeah. A new system, yeah. OK. Yeah. And do you think that introducing a new system will be relieve some of the pressure, the financial pressure in Creative Scotland? Do you think that can be done through an organisational review of how the funding's done? I, I think the organisational review they should be doing anyway to make sure that the... Uh, 
the organisation can function um, to, to its optimum, uh, whether it can release uh, savings. I don't necessarily think uh, trying to find savings within it is necessarily the main focus of it, but obviously any organisation this time should always be looking at how they can release funding um, and, and mm. savings. But that's a question for them rather than for me. Sure. And, and, and do you think that the review and um, could might change or would you like to change the remit of Creative Scotland? Um, I don't have any intention currently to change the remit of Creative Scotland. That again would require uh, legislation which we're not necessarily in, in, in the position that we, we want to do as a government in this this, this period yeah. anyway. Uh, I'm not going to preempt the review because I haven't. I don't know what the review is actually showing so I need to wait until we, we, okay. we see that before I comment. Okay, thanks very much. And, and, and just finally, um, you mentioned that the cultural strategy will be published after the election. Uh, our inquiry uh, report will also be published after the election and before Christmas. We're very keen that you know the, the evidence that we've gathered um, in the report will feed in to the cultural strategy. Are you, uh, is there anything that you can tell us that would um, reassure the committee that the work that we have done will be able to influence the cultural strategy, given the time, you know, obviously the timing's very tight for both. Yeah, well, I'm not responsible for the timing or indeed the subject choices of, of, of the committee, but obviously, as I said at the outset, we do want to take on board what you see in terms of looking at it as to inform us in terms of future policy making. But as this cultural strategy itself will not necessarily be as detailed as I think some of the pro pro propositions are that you take forward, that probably is for subsequently in how people use the... Uh, culture strategy to inform their decision making so and in terms I think we're probably uh, in terms of the timing I don't think it's I mean I, I would have probably liked the strategy to have been published before now but you know we're, we're stuck where we are because of the, the the restrictions so I think it's unrealistic to say that you know you publish the your inquiry on one on day one and then day two it's suddenly going to be absorbed uh, in, in its entirety into the culture strategy that's unrealistic well, I wasn't <laughs> suggesting that for a moment um, yeah, although yeah. you know I'm sure well, that I think the direct I think having looked at your evidence I mean I don't know what your report's going to say because you haven't obviously you've got to discuss what you want to put in it and the last evidence session I understand so I, I don't even know what you're going to recommend I, I have seen some of your evidence base I don't think the evidence base is completely at, you know, at odds with where we'll be going as a direction of travel and the, the culture strategy but we're not necessarily going to have detailed actions that will come saying we will do X, Y and Z or this organisation should do X, Y and Z I don't think the level of detail is going to be the same as what you're going to have in, 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 in your inquiry report I'm assuming I don't know because again I haven't seen it um, and I don't think you've, you've determined it but you will certainly what you put forward will be looked at very very closely I would, I, I would uh, uh, expect from Creative Scotland in terms of their decision making and certainly in, in terms of ourselves either in terms of new initiatives or how we work with local authorities that's a big theme of what you're going to say as well but um, you know the, the timing of this obviously they've got the funding review from Creative Scotland which will be report fairly soon as well but obviously that's a, a piece of work that the committee and your clerks will always do I'm sure in, in working out the time scales of when you initiate different inquiries and what you're trying to, to, to influence and you probably didn't embark on this thinking that you would influence the, the cultural strategy because you as I will have expected the cultural strategy to have been released some time prior to this as well. Do you have a date for the culture strategy? I, we are, it will be after the general election, but as you know, the, that puts us into the week before Christmas. So we're trying to think, uh, along with everything else that's likely to have to be announced, because it can't be announced during a general election process, there's a bit of choreography about when things are done. But as soon as it's practical um, after that, that's our, our okay. view. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence to us today. Uh, we'll now move into private session. Thank okay, you. Thank you.